we thank God for every uh, one of us here on this line, on this platform. Um, it, it is amazing that we are still here. It is amazing that his grace is still upon us. It is amazing that regardless of what we have seen, and heard and been through that he's still with us and i thank god for all of your lives that he has been a blessing in your respective homes in your respective families and in your respective lives we thank god for this week because this past week has been the regional women's week and um the women's ministry uh has been phenomenal we've gone through such a powerful theme the power of prayer, um, the power of a prayerful woman in a glorious church. We thank the leadership for the women's ministry for giving us this opportunity to be able to kind of reflect on the power of prayer. We thank the leaders, Mama Vida and her team, and we thank our local leader, um, Auntie Gifty and, and, and her team for putting uh, today together and um, I'm privileged to be here with all of us here. Without you, there would have been no um, uh, ministry in terms of our week and what God is doing through women. And so um, this morning, um, we're just gonna go um, on our topic, the power of a prayerful woman in a glorious church. I have a subtitle uh, today because um, I'm not sure how many of us missed it, but we've heard so much about the power of prayer. We, as individuals, we all have our testimonies regarding prayer. And so this morning I have a subtitle, uh, Making Our Prayers Effective. So I'm gonna reflect a little bit on the power of prayer and the power of a prayerful woman um, in terms of um, looking back in, in our heroes of faith, women that we have read about and talked about and studied about in the Bible that are our heroes. Um, sometimes, you know, just praying the prayers of some of these uh, women who have gone before us is such an amazing and powerful way to strengthen our own faith because, you know, it, it, it's sometimes you read it and you're in awe. Like you look at Esther, you look at Esther and you look at the amazing risk that she took to stand for her people, even at the time that she could have been killed because she was not invited to the presence of the king. But because of fasting and prayer, she prevailed and she was able to do the impossible. And so that is a, a powerful story that ignites, it, it just rejuvenates our faith in God. And that goes to testify to us that there's the power of prayer is amazing. We look at women like um, Mary. You know, Mary, um, you know, a virgin that, you know, just going about her business and all of a sudden an angel appeared to her and tells her all these things that you're gonna carry the, 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 the savior of the world and this is how it's gonna be and you are not, you know, even though you don't know any man, that you're still gonna be pregnant. I mean, talk about impossibilities. But she embraced it and she said, let it be done unto me, what you have said. And so that is how she embraced that faith and believed. And because of that, you and I are saved this morning, hallelujah. And so when we look at all these women, the, the women in, in Jesus' time, the women in Jesus' time who were looking for all these miracles with Jesus, that they were following this one woman that her story is so amazing. I mean, the faith of these women, I don't know if it, we can ever, you know, meet 
that expectation ever. I mean, she's had the issue of blood for 12 years and with the crowd and everything going on in her time, in some strange reason, she felt like if I'm able to just touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. And amazingly, she strived for that. She pushed forward. She strived, she crawled, she did whatever it took for her to reach that hem of the garment of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And truly and honestly, she received that healing. And so we see the power of prayer, the power that God gives to people that actually believes. The key is for us to believe. And so this morning, with all these women that have gone before us, even Miriam, Miriam, she is the least that we can think of when it comes to prayer for women in the Bible. Think about Miriam. Miriam, a little girl, whose mom, Jochebed, she honestly believed that even though the male-born infants were being killed in the land of Egypt, that she honestly believed that my son has a purpose on his life and he will not be killed. I will make this basket. I will set it on the Nile. I will have Miriam sitting by and see what happens. Watch the glorious hand of God work in a miraculous way. Miriam sat there. He, she watched as the, the princess of Egypt picked up that baby and that baby grew up to be Moses. And when the Lord parted that Red Sea for his people to have that redemption and walk through that sea, and that, that the songs and, and the praises that Miriam came up with to lift up the name of God and to worship, that worship was prayer. That worship was prayer unto the name of God to say, God, you have done from the minute I watched that princess pick up my brother to now as we have made it through the Red Sea and all the, the horses and the army of Egypt have drowned in the Red Sea that God, you are awesome. And that prayer came to pass and we saw the hand of God. And so all these women, all these women are such powerful sources that we look up to and it gingers our faith and it reignites our strength and it gives us more hope to know that the God that we serve is an awesome, awesome God. And he truly is a prayer answering God. So this morning, we're going to read our text. The text given to us was 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. And I'm going to read from the NIV. There was a certain man from Ramathane, a Zufite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, and son of Elihu, and the son of Tohu, and the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah, and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Three, year after year, this man went up for, from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Penina, and to all her, her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. When Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept 
and would not eat, her husband Elkanah would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now, Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorstep of the Lord's house. 10. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly, and she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine nor all beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. 16. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. Amen. So, needless to say that we need to understand this morning that a praying woman is a powerful woman. A praying woman is a dangerous woman. Hallelujah. A praying woman is a relentless woman in the house of God, in her own home, even within her workplace. A praying woman is a powerful woman. But this text shows how Hannah poured herself out. She emptied herself before the Lord because she realized that in verse 9, when she got up after they were eating in, in the course and before they were done, she got up and left. And where did she go? She went to the house of God. She secluded herself because she had something staring in her spirit. She had something staring in her heart. She had some unfinished business to take care of. So she had to seclude herself. You know, sometimes when all is, is, is at the place where it makes no sense when you cannot understand the circumstance that you find yourself in. It's important to seclude yourself. It's important to go to that room. It's important to go to that closet. It's important to get away from everybody. We saw how Jesus did it. He would wake up early in the morning and go to the mountainside and be a alone on his own and communicate with God. And that's what Hannah was doing in this verse, that she got up and she went into the house of God. And that is where she secluded herself and she started pouring out her heart. Because you know what? She didn't go to the phone. She didn't go to her friend's house. 
you know, to tell them how Penina has been mean to her, how Penina is teasing her with the fact that she didn't have a child. She didn't go to any of her friends, but where did she go? She went before the throne of grace. Hallelujah. And so this tells us that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what is going on in our lives, that no person can help us. No, no system can help us. But the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is the one that we need to run to. The Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run into it and they are safe. And so when you're staring up and you, you don't know where to turn and we find ourselves in turmoil, that is when we, we get up. We get up and we seclude ourselves and we go before the Lord and we empty ourselves before the Lord. And so Hannah went and was in the temple. And of course, Eli thought, you know, there was nobody in the temple except for her. So what could she possibly be doing when all her family is somewhere else? If she's not drunk, what is she doing? That was Eli's understanding. And she saw, he saw her mumbling. Her lips were going up and down. But there were no words coming out. Because you know what? She, she was teared up in her spirit. And even in our groanings, the Lord knows what we need. When we look at, when we look at Hagar, Hagar is the least person we will consider when it comes to prayer. Because she got the, really the bad side of the deal. She was used, actually, for somebody's, um, somebody else's dream that, you know, Sarah felt like I really can't give my, my husband a son. So why not use Hagar? So she thought that would be a cool idea. Just use Hagar. Let Hagar give Abraham a, a son and then... Abraham will have a son, then I don't have to be guilty. I don't have to feel bad. So that is where Hagar came in. And after all that, we know the story, or we can read it later, that Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, and then at the end of the day, she was made to leave the house. She was actually driven out of the house. And so here is Hagar with Ishmael with nowhere to go, and what was she going to do? In the course, she got to the middle of nowhere and she started weeping and wailing so deep. See, now Hagar didn't have to pray, but the Lord knew her groanings. The Lord knew her pain. The Lord felt her anguish and even that without saying a word the lord responded and say Hagar, get up and take care of your son that i will bless him and the generations after him so i'm saying this to say that even Hagar, whom we thought was the least of the women when it comes to prayer. The Lord felt Hagar's groanings. And even in the midst of all of that, he came through and answered her prayer and took care of her and her son and the generations after that. So Hannah was in the same spot. Hannah didn't have any other choice but to go before her God. And so when that happened, she didn't just pray. She also backed it up. 
and I backed her prayer up. Hallelujah. When you're confident in the prayers that you pray, you back it up. That Lord, if you give me the son, this is what I'm going to do. I'll give him back to you. That he will work in your house all the days of his life. I will sacrifice my son to you. And the Lord heard her prayer. So this morning, considering all these women of prayer that we have heard about, considering all their groanings and all their prayer and all their, their anguish and, and everything that they had to go through, the question becomes, can we match up to that order? Can we match up to that tall order? Can we be in a place where we believe without a shadow of a doubt that no matter what we go through, that we can go before the throne of grace and be able to seek the face of God and expect something great to happen as a result of our prayer. So this morning, we have to be gingered by this great woman of faith. But the question becomes, how do we become like them? How do we grow our faith? How do we approach God with that power and with that might as they did in their time? So I have three areas that I want us to look at this morning, considering the power of prayer, the power of a prayerful woman, the power of a prayerful woman in a glorious church. So I'm looking at three areas. Number one, the way we prepare ourselves for powerful and effective prayers is to fully surrender ourselves to God. We need to fully surrender ourselves. That's number one. Number two, we need to believe. Because if you look at Hannah, there was something staring up in her that she believed that if only and only if I'm able to go before the Lord and let my requests be known and empty myself to the Lord, that he will hear me. She believed that. And that is why she secluded herself. So number two, we have to believe. And number three, we need to wait in expectation. We need to wait in expectation. So how do we surrender fully with God? How do we surrender to God? The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, 15 through 16, it talks about the holiness of God. And Ms. Annie, if you can read 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16 for us. 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. Hallelujah. I think you're on mute. All right. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read. First Peter one. Fifteen. Okay. To succeed. But like the Holy One who called you, 
Be holy yourselves in all your conduct. Be set apart from the world by your godly character and moral courage. Because it is written, you shall be holy, set apart, for I am holy. Um, if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in reverence, fear of him, and with profound respect for him throughout the time of your stay on earth. Amen. 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 So this verse is talking about the importance of us living a holy life. You know, sometimes we feel like, oh, once we accept the Lord as our savior and we are saved, it's okay for us to just you know, do whatever we want and God God still forgives us and as long as we ask for forgiveness and some people actually, and it's unbelievable, they get ready to do whatever they want to do and mm -hmm. it, 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 it's almost like a strategy, it's a plan. You know, I'm going to do this and right after that, I'm going to ask for forgiveness because God is love mm -hmm. and God will forgive me. So we actually intentionally plan the sin and we sin and we plan to ask for forgiveness. And for some reason, it's okay. But I'm here to tell us this morning that if we're going to be anywhere close to being the powerful, prayerful women to impact our church, our families, and our lives, we need to pursue a life of holiness. Listen, God knows who we are. God knows our heart. God knows, God knows that we probably can never match to his tall order. But he also knows our heart. He also knows the efforts that we make to pursue holiness in Christ. He knows that you know, listen, I know Doris. She's not perfect. She's actually very clumsy in her dealings. But I also know her heart. If she's making an effort, I know it. See, we see what's on the outward. But God sees the heart. So if we are making an effort to lean towards holiness and practice holiness, he knows he knows every effort we make. So if we are striving, and listen, I'm not saying that we are not going to make mistakes. We will make mistakes because we are human. But, you know, if unconsciously something happens and oops, we made a mistake. God knows that you didn't go out intentionally to do whatever you did, but it was a mistake and he forgives that. But when we know and we intentionally do it and we walk in the order of life, then we are drawing from the grace. That is not surrendering to God. That is not looking fully at what God is expecting of us in Christ. I mean, if Christ came to die for you and I, so we can have the grace, we can have the boldness to go before the throne of grace in prayer, then the least we could do is to start walking in the glory. Start walking that our lives will kind of gear towards getting better. That we are not what we used to be because we keep getting better. That we are not going to live the life that we used to live, that we keep getting better. So we need to fully surrender. So if before we accepted Christ, let's say we had a group of friends that we used to hang out with, 
this group of friends we know that really most of them are not ready to accept the Lord. And even when we try to pull them, it, it, it became like a chore. So they are not ready. So they are still living the, the worldly life, doing whatever they want to do, hanging out in clubs, drinking, doing all the things that you and I know that God is looking for us to do better. They're still doing it. So let's say after our first year of being a Christian, we're still hanging out with them. We're still baby Christians. We don't know any better. It goes on and on. Second year, third year. Now, if in the fourth year, for example, if we are still hanging out with these people, then that means there's no growth. That means they are affecting our lives. If, like I said, if they are not infecting you and you're not affecting them, then we have a problem. So let's surrender. When we say we have accepted Christ, and we are a new creation, that all things have passed and all things have become new, let that reflect. Let's have that reflecting in our lives. Let's have that being the source of a reflection in our lives, that we are not the people we used to be. We are getting better every day. So a lot of that, how do we fully surrender? How do we surrender in ways that it goes, it's, it's a, a whole array of ways that we surrender to God. And before we go before him, definitely we need it. So Jesus said, you know, if you're coming to me and you have a problem with your brother or sister or acquaintance or whoever, go and solve that problem before you come to me. So that in itself tells you, and when he taught us how to pray, he said, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. So that is the testament of forgiveness. And that is a surrender. We are saying that, you know, whatever it is that, we are going through that we are casting our cares to the lord we hand we are letting the lord handle that we are not going to keep the hurt the pain the bitterness that we are surrendering fully and and i'm here to tell us it's not easy for the past few months i have been sued in court in ghana by my own brothers. And what was the lawsuit about? My father passed about four years ago and he left us this hotel in Kumasi. This is a hotel that my dad and my mom had run since we were kids. So it's been there for decades. And so when my dad passed in his will, he said that I should manage the hotel, that he doesn't want the hotel to be sold. He wants it to be run and he wants it to be passed on from generation to generation. Now keep in mind, I'm not the oldest. I'm number three. And there are two men before me. And there are three men behind me. And I'm the only girl in the middle. So my question was, why did my dad do that when I have older brothers that could have done this? Why should he put me in that predicament? So now they hate me because I'm the one that was given that responsibility. Forgetting that it's a, it's a, it's a job. It's not a fanfare. It's a job that I 
I'm here in America and I'm still working in Ghana on a daily basis, on phones, on conference calls, staff meetings, everything. And it's not a joke. So my first thing was, why am I being given this responsibility when there are older guys that could probably do it better than I can ever do it? But the more I thought about it, it was like, God knows why I can't, first of all, my dad is gone and I can't question him. He, he can't give me the answer and I have to trust God for where I find myself. So one of the brothers said, well, we are not interested in the hotel. So three of us are looking for our share in the hotel. So we think that it should be sold and every, the money distributed among us and everybody go their way. We don't, we don't want anything to do with that. So I said, okay, you, you, that's, that's your, your opinion. And so let us just meet as a group, including my mother, thank God she still lives. So let us meet and let us discuss this and let us see what the general consensus is and then we'll go from there. So they said, okay, we're gonna be on the Zoom meeting. Every one of them said fine and whatnot. The day came, long story short, they never showed up. And the next thing we know, an injunction has been filed against me being named as the defendant and my mother by her own sons. Hallelujah. Now, here we are trying to live a godly life, trying to get closer and closer to God. But here I am, I have my own brothers, one mother, one father, suing me and dragging their mother in the toe in the process. What are you gonna do? At one point I felt like killing all of them. Honestly, that's how I felt. But you know what? You know, it took me a while. I sent them a message and this is what I said. I said, look, I don't know what kind of money you think you're gonna get out of this, that you're gonna spend all the days of your life, that you're never going to run out. And I think you guys missed the part where it said, honor your father and your mother. I think you all missed that boat. It left you at the shore. And I think the least you could do is to take this case out of court and talk to your own mother. And let us talk as a family, because this doesn't require us to go to court none of them responded to me. They thought it was a joke. They thought talking wouldn't give them the money they need. Talking will probably end up convincing them to take the case out of court and they have nothing in their pocket as a result. And so they're not gonna do it. Now, these are not even people that live in Ghana that I would say that, you know, times are hard, COVID is strong and they're all downtrodden. They live here and one of them is in London. So it's not like they really need this money. So I'm not sure if it was to spite me or it was just the whole fact of me being the managing um, um, sibling of, of, the, of the company. I don't know what it is, but whatever it was, I saw the, the Sambalats and the Tobias in the day of Naimea, just creeping up from their woodwork coming towards me because I'm, I'm starting a renovation. I'm cleaning up the hotel. I'm trying to do what my dad said I should do, but it's a problem. Now I go to court. So this case has been in court for months now. So, I, I just, at some point, I was so bitter. And I'm telling you this because, you know, this is my personal life. And sometimes it's hard to share your personal life because you don't want it to be out there. But I need for us to understand the power of obeying God and letting it go. I just prayed and I said, Lord, this is hard. 
because I I don't feel like forgiving them. I, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't work so easy with me to forgive these three stooges. I can't I can I cannot. I said, Holy Spirit, can you please help me? Help me to where I can actually forgive them and I can actually pray for them. Because initially when the case came out, when I was served with a court document, I lost it. So when I sought the presence of the Holy Spirit, I began to confess my forgiveness, that I forgive them and I pray for them. Because you know why? I saw behind them that there was an enemy that was bringing division into my family. And that enemy was the devil using my brothers as the key, as the tool to bring division in my family. So my target is not my brothers, but my target is the devil himself. So I started targeting my prayers that way, that Lord, please forgive me for even thinking that I have to revenge against what they have done. I said, Lord, please help me forgive them and help them to see clearly what is happening and what they have done. I mean, my mother was heartbroken. She could not believe, and that's where my, my sore point was, is my mother. She's 80 years old and she's all energetic and she's so involved in everything we do. And she was so heartbroken and people were asking her, that's the worst part. Are these people your sons? Did you give birth to them? And that's what worsened the whole thing. So long story short, each time there was a court date, something happened in the last four months. It's either one of the attorneys didn't show up. It's either some document didn't show up. It's either the judge was not satisfied with whatever file they presented. There was always something. So I was about to fire the attorney on the case because I felt like somebody wasn't doing their job. How hard is this? This is a no brainer. So it's like one thing after the next. Then I, I, I paused a little bit. And then I said, wait a minute, I'm praying. So why am I questioning what is happening? I have to believe that the hand of God is in the process. And I have to surrender everything fully to him and accept whatever comes out of this. And so I, I, just, I just continued to pray. And I said, Lord, please, whatever you think that should be the way this should go, I leave it up to you. But give the, this widow, my mom, give her justice. Give her justice for her own sons taking her to court. And last Friday, finally, the case was the judgment came down and the case was thrown out of court last Friday. Amen. So I'm saying this to say that there is power when we surrender to God. There is so much power because the power is not to fight. The power is to let go and let God and pray for the ones that are hurting you the most. Can you imagine your own brothers taking you to court? How hurtful can that be? But then I cried. I have cried. I have cried. I have wept. I have like, I've done whatever in my own little closet without anybody seeing me. I have cried. But then when I released it to the Lord and I said, take charge and take control of this, he showed up and he did his thing. And I, he wouldn't have done it if I hadn't surrendered. If I hadn't forgiven 
my brothers, if I hadn't opened and emptied myself and saw who was behind what we were going through, that there was a power behind what they were doing, that the enemy was using them to bring division because God is not a God of division. He's a God of unity. And the enemy knew that unity will bring strength to whatever was going on. And he had to quickly bring division to stop whatever progress that we were making. And so that is the power of surrendering gearing towards holiness, living the life, walking the steps, you know, ordering, seeking God to order our steps and be able to release every bitterness, every, every hurt, every wickedness out of our system and forgive no matter what. That is how we surrender. And then we have to believe. We have to believe Hannah believed. She believed that, look, if I do this, if I seclude myself, and if I go in, and if I cry unto the Lord, and in my anguish, in my pain, if I empty myself, that God is going to hear me, and God will answer the prayer. And sometimes the belief means calling a prayer partner, somebody. Like Melissa said, she called her mom, she called her mother-in-law. Sometimes you just have to call somebody in support and pray and believe. Believe that God is going to come through. And when we look at the verse nine of First Samuel, it, it, just, it just solidifies the fact that we have to be able to trust and know for sure that when we go before him, that something is going to come out of it. And something good is going to come out of that when we separate ourselves from the rest and be able to seek the face of God. So through the weeping, through the anguish, through the challenge, through all of that, God was able to hear that prayer. And not only that, when the, when the prophet, when Eli saw that, oh, this woman is not just drunk, but she's actually seeking the faith. Listen, brethren, sometimes we just have to go crazy for the Lord. Hallelujah. Sometimes we have to go crazy depending on how bad we need him. We have to go crazy before the Lord. If you need to lock up in a room, if you need to, whatever you need to do, people will think you're crazy. Your children will probably think you're crazy. Your husband, your wife, whoever will think, what in the world has come over this person? Your friends will think, oh my God, they've lost it. But you know what? You know that you're not drunk. You know that you're not crazy. You know what you know. You know what you're saying seeking from the almighty God. And it is okay to go crazy before God. It is okay to look like you're drunk before God because you know what you're looking for. And you know that when you empty yourself before him, that he is going to come through for you. You know, sometimes the failures and the disappointments that we go through it sometimes it, it's so hard that it draws us away from our faith. We lose that hope sometimes, and we question we question the fact that, oh, um, you know, is this even gonna work? Is, is this prayer gonna actually work? Because you're looking at statistics, you're looking at the balance in the bank account, you are looking at the fact that you cannot go to court in Ghana because there's COVID. You are looking at the fact that the numbers show that you know the unemployment rate is so high, the company is laying off, they've lost a lot of clients, the product is not in high demand. You're looking at all these statistics and you're saying that this is probably not going to work. 
but we always have to keep in mind the promises of God, the power and the promises of God. We have to believe. We have to believe in that. Isaiah 40, um, um, Isaiah 40, 31 it says that those that those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Isaiah forty one ten it says, "Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my right, my righteous right hand." So these are some of the promises that are tons and tons and tons of promises. When you have time, you can read Deuteronomy chapter 31 and 8 and John 16, 33. All these are promises of God. That God, Jesus is saying, behold, I have overcome the world. He said, in this world, you will face trials. You will face tribulations. But behold, I have overcome the world. So regardless of what you go through, regardless of what you go through, trust and believe. Believe in the promises and the power of God. He said, his word said, you have not because you ask not. Ask with passion. Ask with belief. Ask with the power and the consolation that you are not asking in your own name. You are asking in the name of Jesus, putting the stamp of Jesus on your prayer. That is your power. Jesus is your stamp. You're putting that stamp on your mail. You're putting that stamp on your package. You cannot lose hope. You cannot waver because the power of your belief and the promises and the promises of God and his power is uh, it's unbelievable, is astronomical. We cannot fathom his power. On my trip, to this location that I'm in. I'm looking at the ocean and I'm thinking, how in the world can the ocean stay in their place without crossing their boundaries? Without crossing their boundaries, why is the atmosphere in place without dropping on us? Isn't there a power behind that? Isn't there a power that is holding all these things in place? That is the God that you and I serve. We need to kind of tap into that power and believe. Put that Jesus stamp on there in the name of Jesus. Whatever you are seeking, what if it's a job, if it's money, if it's you know your family, if it's your marriage, if it's a, a partner, whatever you are looking for, ask with passion and believe. If it's your business, ask with passion and believe. Believe that God will come through. Put that Jesus stamp on there. You ask not, and you have not. Ask, and you shall be given. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. And once we surrender, and once we believe in the power and the promises of God, then we have to wait in expectation. We have to wait in expectation. We already know that those that wait upon the Lord shall always renew their strength. We don't want to see that face, that sad face. You're fasting and praying, and when you come out, it's like somebody died. And everybody's wondering what is wrong with us. Why is she looking that way? Because you, you, you're showing that there's something wrong. No, we don't, we don't want to be that kind of Christians. We, even when we are fasting, even when we are praying, even when we don't know how it's going to turn out, we have cast our care. Now, once we cast our care, we have to boldly come out and live and enjoy our day and not let everybody feel like, well, I can't enjoy my life because I have this problem going on. 
what that means is you don't trust in what you just prayed about. You don't trust in what you're fasting. And plus, you don't trust in the God that you're praying to. You're not sure, you know. You know, some people can, you know, find ways to kind of make it so bad that when you see our faces, you think that the world is probably coming to an end. And we just came out of our prayer closet. We need to come out with that bubbling of expectation and joy within us. That, you know, I have handed this over to the King of Kings, to the Lord of Lords, to the Alpha, to the Omega, to the beginning, to the end, to the one without whom nothing was made that was made. I mean, no lawyer can stand before him. No judge can stand before him. No power can overrule him. No personality can stand before him. That is the one to whom I have surrendered and cast my care. So at this point, I would have a good day. I will have a good life. I would walk according to his promises and enjoy our day. We cannot cast our cares and also be disappointed in a way when he has already told us that he will not leave us nor forsake us. Sometimes it is hard because it seems you've, we've prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and we begin to lose patience. We begin to lose that hope because we don't understand the fact that we need to align our will with the will of God. So if your will is in alignment with the will of God, then it's okay if it takes forever because you know it will come. You know it would come, and whatever comes will be to your benefit. It will be the best of the best that God has ever done in your life because you know that he knows the end from the beginning. He will not give us anything that will not benefit us. That is what we need to trust and continue to cast that care. We can cast the care and wonder and wonder how this is going to happen. We cannot do that. So let's begin to, I mean, while we wait, let's continue to show the love of God to people, even when we are going through stuff. Show the love of Christ to people. If somebody needs our help, if somebody needs anything that we feel like we could be of help, let us not feel like, okay, because we are going through problems that we cannot do anything to show the love of God to people. Even it's through that, that God is going to bless you and I. So this morning, I'm here to encourage us. I'm here to lift us up. I'm here to tell us that what a privilege we have in taking everything to God in prayer. It's a privilege. And so we have that privilege. We have the God that is above every name. We are so excited about that. We are so tickled about the fact that we have a God that we can run to. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run. We can run. We can run. We can run and never be tired because we know that the God that we serve is faithful and he will come through no matter what. So this morning, regardless of what you go through, if whatever you are expecting, whatever you're expecting in school, in your career, in your job, in your finances, in everything, in your, in your home, in your marriage, in everything that you're looking for the Lord for, let us trust in the Lord and let us continue to trust in him and let us continue to surrender to him.
And then I leave you with this, as Eli said, go in peace and may the God of Israel this morning grant you what you have asked of him. This week, whatever you have asked of the Lord, this week, this month, this year, whatever you, any one of us, whatever you have asked of the Lord, may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him and may his face continue to shine upon you and upon your prayers and because of you may your church be blessed may your children be blessed may your career be blessed may your family be blessed may your going out and coming in be blessed all to the glory of the name of the living God God bless you Amen Amen. 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 Amen.